الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفر ونستهديه ونتوب إليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم عبد الله ورسوله إخواني في الله وأخواتي في الإسلام أوصي نفسي وإياكم بتقوى الله عز وجل وبعدم إسياني فلقد قال لي ولكم تلك الدار الآخرة نجعلها للذين لا يريدون علوا في الأرض ولا فسادا والعاقبة للمتقين We thank the Almighty Allah for blessing us with such a wonderful day We thank him for his message that he's bestowed upon us We bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except the Almighty Allah. We also bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad is his servant and his messenger. 
Today is Monday, the 11th day of Ramadan, 1,441 years after the Hijrah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which also corresponds with the fourth day of May 2020. We are on the 10th day of our Ramadan series, trying to look at Ramadan and pick uh, some lessons from the month of Ramadan and to inculcate them in our lives and then beyond Ramadan too. As we have been repeating, Ramadan is a school where you enroll to study some skills. And after the course has ended, the expectation is that you continue implementing those skills in your life. I always try to give this analogy that when you send your child to school for a period of time, when they come back home after studying, you expect to see some improvement and some changes in their lifestyles. But when you ask them basic questions about the very things that they study at school and then you find them wanting, then there is a great deal of concern and the apparent meaning might be that what they went to school to learn has not really sat down well with them or that they didn't learn at all. So after the month of Ramadan, it is expected individually and collectively as Muslims that these very skills that we've learned in the month of Ramadan, you know, the patience, the love, the commitment, the brotherhood, the, the, the fasting, the recitation of the Quran, the remembrance of the Almighty Allah. These are all lessons that we are learning in this month, all of us, irrespective of whether we are sheikhs or not, irrespective of whether we are elderly people or younger people. Ramadan is a course that all of us have a role in. And the expected outcome really starts on the day of Eid. So after Ramadan, we need to check ourselves and look at the certificates that we had, the transcripts, the terminal results of the activities that we went through in the month of Ramadan. It is on the day of Eid that we really, really, really will really show that, yes, we went through Ramadan. We didn't just pass around it. You know, when a child comes home with a terminal report and you find out that the results were very bad, definitely you'll be disappointed. So it's the same way we need to do a self-introspection in our own selves and, and try and tell ourselves the truth that after the month of Ramadan, will we be better people? After the month of Ramadan, will we be able to, to really, really say, yes, Alhamdulillah, we went through the month of Ramadan successfully. So these are the kind of questions that we need to be asking ourselves in this moment. One third of Ramadan is gone. We've now entered the second part of the month of Ramadan, that is the middle 10 days. So it's it's very important. We were, before some months, all, you know, anxious waiting for the month of Ramadan. Ramadan is coming, Ramadan is coming, Ramadan is coming. We're anxious sighting the moon. And look how quickly the days went by. It's been 11 days since we started Ramadan. And that's the reality. It only tells you how fleeting this world is, that nothing is permanent, not even Ramadan. And understand that this Ramadan that we are in is different from the Ramadan that is gone, that has passed. 
and it's definitely different from the next Ramadan that is coming because this very Ramadan itself is a servant of the Almighty Allah. It will also return to the Almighty Allah and give an account of what it came to do. Same way each and every one of us will go back to the Almighty Allah and give an account of what we really came to do in the dunya. So the lessons that we listen to, we should really take them serious. Let's not listen to those lessons for listening sake. Let's not join live feeds on social media to listen to scholars elaborate and expound on you know issues concerning our deen and religion and lifestyles just for listening sake no let's not do it to kill boredom it's very important when we listen to these lectures we have with us our papers and our pens taking notes is very very important because there is no moment in our lives that we wouldn't be accountable for in the Akhirah. There is no moment in our lives that we will go scot-free without the Almighty Allah asking us and questioning us how we work, how we utilize them. So today we are going to look at Quran part two. Yesterday we started with the Quran and then we saw that the Almighty Allah from time to time he sent down messengers with them books and according to the needs of civilization at that time he sends to them the needed solutions to the problems that they face and we made example of some prophets and then you know the challenges that their civilizations faced some civilizations faced you know corruption in businesses some civilizations face corruption in terms of, you know, uh, you, the Unitarian aspect of, you know, the religion. Some civilizations faced, you know, corruption in terms of moral values. Some civilizations faced corruption in terms of, you know, sexual values. So the Almighty Allah from time to time, he revealed messengers and sent with them, you know, books, manuals that would serve as guidelines for the people at that time. And the final message that the Almighty Allah has revealed is the Quran. And we said the Quran is not only for Muslims. The Quran is a guidance for mankind totally. So non-Muslims can have copies of the Quran and read because it is the message of their God to them, irrespective of whether they believe in the messengerhood of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or not, the Quran is a universal book. It is a treasure for the world. So Muslims, don't hide your Quran from non-Muslims. Give it to them as gifts for them to read and understand the message of the Almighty Allah. If we hide the Quran and then they don't get the message of the Almighty Allah, that we've not done our due in trying to disperse this message. So what then is the Quran? What is the definition of the Quran? There has been a lot of definitions of the Quran ranging from describing the Quran to giving it adjectives, descriptions, values, attributes. But a few of these definitions really, really encompass what the Quran really, really means or stands for. One of the famous definitions of the Quran is that it's Kalamullah al Munazzal. It is the revealed word of the Almighty Allah. So it's inequivocal in Islam that the Quran, it's the direct word of the Almighty Allah, the direct words of the Almighty Allah. In our previous videos, we made mention of you know, attributes to the Almighty Allah. Does the Almighty Allah talk or not? In the Aqid of al Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the Almighty Allah speaks, He talks, but then not like we human beings. So the general ruling in Asma'a wa Sifa, the attributes and then 
the descriptions or the characteristics of the Almighty Allah. The general rule when it comes to the Aqid of al Sunnah wal Jama'ah is that when the Almighty Allah makes mention of anything of his sifat, we establish what he says without negating them, without substituting them, without changing them, without giving them meanings that he, the Almighty Allah, has not given them. And then we don't also try to personify it according to human values. The Almighty Allah describes himself using words that we understand because that's the way he's programmed us. So when we say the Almighty Allah speaks, it doesn't mean that he has a mouth because he didn't say he has a mouth. He speaks. There are words that come out. And there are verses in the Holy Quran that substantiates that the Almighty Allah speaks. For example, وَكَلَّمَ Allahu Musa taklima. And Almighty Allah spoke with Moses, Musa. In speech, he spoke with him. So that's Kalamullah. It's the word of the Almighty Allah. It's not the word of any person. It's not the message of Jibreel. Jibreel is just a messenger who, who, who delivers the message. So you have in the Quran, Nazala bihi ruh al amin that the spirit you know comes down with it that is jibreel the quran is not the word of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. no it's not the word of any historian it is the words of the almighty allah and that is why the almighty allah challenges the world وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا If you are in doubt concerning this message that I have revealed to my servant, فَأْتُوا بِأَشْرِ سُوَرٍ مِثْلِهِ Bring, you know, فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِثْلِهِ Bring a single chapter of the Qur'an. Produce a single book of the Qur'an. And this challenge is still alive to date that if you doubt the quran or if you have any issues with the quran then produce a single chapter that is in the likeness of the quran the wondrous nature of the quran is such that the moment you read the quran wrongly it doesn't suit down well with your soul this very verse, I read it wrongly, and the soul itself went back and said, no, 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 this didn't come out well. Even though the wrong words that I read, and please, it was not intentional too. It was not intentional. It was not to prove a point at all. It is just the Almighty Allah doing his will. I read the verse wrongly, not intentionally. Even though the wrong part that I read is also another verse in another chapter. This is to tell you that, that the Almighty Allah, the Quran is the word of the Almighty Allah. The moment you make a mistake, your soul itself will, 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 will correct you, will alert you, will let you know that, you no, know, no, no, what you are saying now is not correct. Because it's the word of the Almighty. And any time you make a mistake, the people next to you will correct you. And it happens. So the Almighty Allah is saying that if you have doubts about the Quran, if you think differently about the Quran, if you think, if you doubt its authenticity and its efficacy, produce something of its quality. Almighty Allah is telling you, if you can't, and then he's really emphasizing and telling you, and you can't, you can't do it. Then be fearful or be mindful, be cautious of a hellfire that its kindling materials are human beings and then stones. The Quran's level of eloquence 
is so high that it is the standard for Arabic grammar. And even Arab non-Muslims attest to the superiority of the Quran. Arab non-Muslims. Someone might think oh, this is absurd. Yes, there are Arabs who are non-Muslims because we are Arab, we have Arabs that are Christians. We have Arabs that are Jews on the Judaism, on the Judaic. Uh, 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 religion, not Jews as the race or ethnic. Yes, they are there. You go to Palestine, you find it. You go to Egypt, you get that. There are Arabs who are atheists. That is why Islam is not the sole prerogative of the Arabs. As we said earlier, Islam does not belong to the Arabs. And even the races that are in Islam, the Arabs are not top in terms of the number of Muslims in the world. So the Almighty Allah said that you can't produce the likeness of the Quran. First, the challenge was bring 10 verses. Asher Rasuwari Muftariyat. Create, forge. The, 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 the battlefield was open that the Almighty Allah said, Muftariyat, you can forge them, you can create them verses of that or 10 verse or 10 chapters that are in like of the quran you can create them forge and bring they couldn't now bring only one chapter they couldn't the battlefield was narrowed down to 10 verses they couldn't so kalamullah al munazzal it was revealed the revelation of the Quran is a whole science, a whole subject on its own. When you come to Ulum al Quran, the sciences of the Quran, Al Wahi itself, revelation, is a whole chapter on its own. How does Almighty Allah reveal and stuff like that? We're not going to talk about that because it will stray us out of our course and will end up turning this Ramadan series into Ulum al-Quran, which is not our goal for now. It was revealed. The revelation of the Quran took 23 years. And it was revealed according to the needs and the situations and the conditions of the time of this of this or of that period. Meaning the Quran was not revealed in one book straightforward to the Prophet Muhammad. No. It was removed from the law al Mahfuz to the first heaven as a book. But then if the need arises, verses or whole chapters were revealed to the Prophet Muhammad in answering questions that both Muslims and non-Muslims asked, or in explaining issues of the day, whether they were political whether they were you know economical whether they were social whether they were judicial and stuff like that some of the verses jibreel والسلام, comes with them alone but then there is a narration that says that surat al-an'am jibreel came down with seventy thousand angels with surat al-an'am one of the chapters of the whole quran Jibril was escorted with 70,000 angels. They came down with Surah al -Ara. Sometimes Jibril will come in the form of a human being and the Sahaba will see him. But in those instances, he didn't come to reveal verses of the Holy Quran. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will, reveal, will receive this revelation, this wahi, and after receiving them, he had secretaries who wrote the Quran. He will recite to them, and then they will write it down, either on parchment papers, either on leaves, either on the back of trees, or on walls, or on stone tablets. They will write it as the Prophet Muhammad recited to them whatever he heard from Jibreel. And then because they were not revealed the way we see them. For example, the first verse to the
to be revealed is Iqra bismi rabbik alladhi khalaq surah alaq but then in the arrangement of the quran it is the 96th chapter in the quran in because in the arrangement of the quran we have two forms of arrangement the one that we know now in the quran fatiha baqara al imran nisa ima ida down this is the tartibu ta'budi this is the worship arrangement and then we have tartibu nuzuli the revelation arrangement which is also different from that and which is very technical and is the big scholars that can do that those of us that you see here even though we know it by then it is a whole job on its own surah to alaq was the first to be revealed then mudaffir came after it so you find out that in the arrangements of the quran that we have now it is not according to the arrangements the way the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam received it for example surah al-baqarah chapter 2 verse 282 is the last verse to be revealed in the quran وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا تُرْجَعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ ثُمَّ تُوَفَّى كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا كَسَبَتْ وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ Be mindful of the day that you are going to be returned to the Almighty Allah and then every soul will be recompensed according to what they did and then the Almighty Allah is not going to cheat anybody Ibn Abbas said this verse was revealed nine days later the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died some say the last verse to be revealed in the Quran is Al-Yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum al-Islam al-Deena. This verse was revealed on the ninth day of Arafah in the tenth year of Hijrah on a Friday. This verse was revealed three months before the death of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is not the last verse to be revealed in the Quran. But then after that verse, no new law was revealed. Every verse that came after it that consisted of any law was just a reminder of previous laws that were revealed in the Quran. So the verse Aliyom Akmal Tulakum Dinakum is not the last verse in the Quran. Just that it was the verse that came to seal Islam, seal the prophethood, seal the message of the Almighty Allah. And after it, no new law was revealed but then the last categorical verse in the quran is surah al-baqarah verse 282 even though we know surah al-baqarah has 286 verses but then the last verse in the quran is not the last verse in surah al-baqarah in terms of the arrangement that we have in the quran because when the verses were revealed the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will tell the Sahaba, you see this verse, put it in so so and so surah. You see this verse, put it in so so and so surah. You see this verse, put it in so so and so surah. You see this verse, put it in so so and so surah. So that's how we have come to have the arrangement we have in the Quran. So the arrangement you have now, Fatiha, Baqarah, Al Imran, Nisa'i, Ma'ida, these arrangements were wahi from the Almighty Allah. It was not out of the own thing of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was not out of the own volition of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Neither is it the, the trials and error of the Sahaba after the death of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. No. It was why. So that is how we have these arrangements of the Quran and the verses that we have. So this was the revelation of the Quran. How then did the Quran came to be, you know, in a book form? Yes, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, during his time, the Quran was not collated into a book form, no. And there were reasons why it didn't happen because it was already in a manuscript form. It was not as if the Quran was, you know, revealed in one book for it to be in a book form, for the Prophet to recite it 
threw out to the Sahaba for them to write it down. And remember, the Prophet Muhammad was unlettered. He didn't write. He didn't read. This is part of the, 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 the wonderful nature of his prophethood and then the Quran itself. Because if the Prophet Muhammad had been a scholar before the messengerhood, it would have been easy. People would say, oh, he's already a scholar. So when he produces such a book, then there is no amazement in that. But then because he had not sat in a classroom and then he's coming to speak such words, and then the Kufar of Makkah knew that he was not a poet. So they, they knew that, no, that is why they said he was a mad person. That is why they said he was a charlatan. That is why they said he was a magician. But then they never said he was a scholar. Because they knew who he was. He was with them. He grew up amongst them. They knew him. They knew his father. They knew what was going on. So, this, it's a wonderful thing that this is a man who, the only time he left, you know, his hometown was twice. When he went on a trade caravan with his uncle, when he was around 12 years old. And then when he was in his late 30s, he went also in a great trade caravan to Syria as, 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 as an agent for Khadija. That's the only two times that he left his hometown. So he didn't have time to go and study outside or meet anybody. But then he was able to produce such a book. That is 1,400 odd years old, unadulterated, unchanged, no new edits, no new models, no new editions. He did that. So the, it was not a book in a way that the Sahaba had it. No, it was revealed in pieces. So you cannot have it written in a book when you don't know when the next, you know, next verse will come. But after the death of the Prophet Muhammad during the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq, they went to a war and about 500 of the memorizers of the Quran were killed. So they had to sit down and think, if the memorizers of the Quran are being killed, and then we are not able to safeguard the Quran, it will get to a time when the memorizers of the Quran are all dead, and then we don't have the Quran for the next generation. So they sat down and then they called Zaid ibn Thabit, one of the chief scribes of the Prophet Muhammad for him to come and gather the Quran. So he had two methodologies that he used in gathering or collating or compiling the verses of the Quran. First, he relied on the memory of the Sahaba, those who have memorized the Quran. Secondly, he relied on the manuscripts that were available. So whatever was in the manuscripts should tally with what was in the memory of the people. And whatever is in the memory of the people should tally with what was in the manuscripts. So he collated the Quran using these two criteria. And the copy, the copy of that Quran was with Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. So it was with him for some time until his death and then it, the copy of the Quran went to Umar because Umar became the Khalifa. After the assassination of Umar radiallahu anhu, the copy was given to his daughter Hafsa, who happened to also be the wife of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of the wives of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So during the time of Uthman ibn Affan, they went to, a complaint was brought to Uthman that because of the different races and tribes that were entering into Islam, the methodology of the recital of the Quran is being changed. People were reading the Quran wrongly. They didn't have copies of the Quran in mass production. So people were reading the Quran wrongly because of difference in, you know, the tongues that we have. 
and because some nations and some tribes didn't have some of the letters that are in Arabic. For example, a word, a word is a peculiar letter to the Arabic language. A vel is a peculiar letter to the Arabic language. A tha is a peculiar letter to the Arabic language. A sort is a peculiar letter to the Arabic language. So people who grew up in their languages that they didn't have, you know, pronunciations or intonations of these letters in their languages found it difficult in reading or in, 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 in pronouncing some of these letters. And then they pronounced them to suit what they knew. So the need for correcting that anomaly rose. So the same guy, Zaid Ibn Thabit, was called again. The guy who did the first comparison during Abu Bakr's time was still alive during Uthman's time. So he was called again, and then that copy of the Quran that was with Hafsa, the wife of the Prophet Muhammad and the daughter of Umar, was collected again. And then a new writing of the Quran was done with new copies. So those people who had manuscripts from their own writings that were wrong had to burn their copies because those copies were not copies of the Quran. Some people he say that, why did Uthman burn those copies because so so and so they were not the Quran and stuff like that and the Quran is not authentic and so and so and so that it is all gibberish because not all not all of the Sahaba burned their manuscripts those Sahaba who were writing their own Quran during the time of the Prophet Muhammad and after him they were able to compile their own Qurans they didn't burn them. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud had his own manuscript. And scholars of Tafsir to date made reference or still make references to the manuscript of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud because it survived. And some of the Sahaba also had their own manuscripts. So not all the manuscripts were burnt. The manuscripts that were burnt at that time were manuscripts that did not go well with the main manuscript of the Quran. So in Qiraat, we have criteria for supporting the various variations of the Quran that we hear, Hafs, Warsh, Qalun, Bazi, Khalad, Khalaf, and, this, and these recitations that you hear from scholars who read the Quran, like the late Khalil Husari, may the Almighty Allah forgive him, uh, and stuff up to up to up to Basit, up to summit that you hear, and then to the ones who are alive, like Sheikh Abdul Rashid Sufi, my own Sheikh Kukasha, that you that you hear, it, it, it is not a creation of anybody. It is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam who taught that. He taught them. Just that the names that you have now, Warsh and Nafir. That you hear, it, they are the names of the people who through them these recitations became famous. But it is not the Prophet Muhammad who named them because these people were centuries, one or two centuries after the Prophet Muhammad. Some generation generations of time. Just that the Quran was was transmitted we'll come to that definition was transmitted bitawatu generations to generations to generations to generations to generations the quran was memorized in hearts of people and also on parchments so these two complemented each other that is why the quran was able to survive So, Qira'a must be at tawatur, mutawatir, that it was revealed or it was transmitted 
generations upon generations, people huge in number, that the possibility of them all making a mistake at the same time was very, very negligible. And that, that recital should be in tandem with the manuscript that Uthman wrote. That is why we call it Rasmul Uthmani, the Uthmanic manuscript on Uthmanic calligraphy. If you observe the writing of the Quran, you find out that the writing differs from the writing of normal Arabic. The example is like this. If you have this word in Rasm, if you have this word, this word, for example, that we have here is Maliki in Fatiha. Maliki Yawmiddin. This is Maliki Yawmiddin. But then in the Quran, it is written like this. Maliki. You see the difference? Maliki. This long one here is now the small one here. That is how it is written in the Quran. In writing normal Arabic, Maliki, you write the one on top. But then in writing the Quran, you write it like this. Why? Because there is a recital that says Maliki Yomidin. And then there is a recital that says Maliki Yomidin. But if you write it like this, Maliki, the recital of Maliki will not be accommodated in there. But if you write it like the one that was written below, Maliki, the recital of Maliki is also accommodated in there. That is Rasmul Uthman, the writing of the Uthmanic way. That is how the Quran was written. So you find out that some words in the Quran, their writing is different from the way we write normal Arabic. It is a science on its own. Even though some of the scholars differ, when you're writing the Quran on your own, in your writings or in your daily activities, should you follow the Rasmul Uthmani by force compulsory? Imam Malik was of the view that no, it's not compulsory. If you are writing according to one variation of the recital of the Quran, and that is, you know, the moderate and then the middle part of that. So, this Rasmul Uthmani, this Uthmanic calligraphy was written in copies and then it was distributed within the communities of the Muslims and then other copies were made from that. And to date we have that, you know, uh, form of calligraphy that is still in existence more than 1,400 years. So we are still kita on Kilamullah al Munazzal, the word of the Almighty Allah that was revealed, and then its revelation and how the Quran came to be in this book form that we have during the time of Uthman radiallahu an. Al Munazzal that was revealed, ala Muhammadin sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Quran is the book that was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So. Any book that was revealed to the other prophets is not called Al-Quran. It's not called Al-Quran. The Quran is the book that was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Bil Arabiya, with the Arabic language. This is a very, very important point here. The translations that we have in other languages are not the Quran. They are translations of the meanings of the Quran. Some scholars are even particular about these definitions. They say there are translations of the possible meanings of the Quran because the Quranic wording is so supreme that it is very, very difficult for you to get an exact word in another language that suits that word. 
That is why you have different translations. Abdullah Yusuf Ali, Muhammad Piktal, you have Sahih International. If you look at all of them and then you pick the translations that they have for a particular verse, you find out they all have different words. And all these different words, even though they all, you know, shoot towards a particular meaning, but they are different. Sometimes if you look at them analytically, you find out sometimes they all give different meanings. That is why the Quran is not in any other language apart from the Arabic language. The Almighty Allah chose that language to protect his book. And if you observe other languages and then the way they've evolved throughout time, you realize that it is very wonderful that the Quran was revealed in this language and it is still like that after 1,400 years. The English language in the past 200 years has evolved and changed. So is the French language. If you go to 16th century England and they are speaking, you wouldn't understand. But then you go to 6th century Arabia, Mecca, and then those of us who speak Arabic, we will speak Arabic fluently and easily without any hindrance. That is part of the secret of the Quran being in this particular language. So if someone comes and then he says, all thanks and adorations be to the Almighty Allah, he's not reading the Quran. He's rather giving us meanings of the, he's rather giving us a translation of the possible meanings of the Quran. That is why it is possible to give an un-Muslim the Quran in English and French for the person to hold and use. The difference of opinion is what if the Quran is in Arabic? That is where the scholars differ. Some say fine, you can, some say not. But what if that non Muslim is an Arab and he doesn't understand any language apart from the Arabic language? This is where the scholars who give the permissibility say that yes, because the Prophet Muhammad himself, the Arabs, the non Muslims at his time, were able to have parchments of the Quran where they read and then they saw what he was really saying and then they had debates with him or they had whatever they had to say about him. This is just about something on their side. But the Quran is in Arabic. So for you to enjoy the Quran and understand it really, really well, it is incumbent on you to study the Arabic language. If you don't know the Arabic language, it is very, very difficult for you to really, really grasp the message of the Quran or the message of Islam itself in its generality. That is why it's a very, very big mistake if you have not studied Islam for you to make yourself a self-imposed mufti, giving fatwa anyway, left, right, and center, or you trying to speak your mind about religious issues, especially in Islam. Even though Islam is not a religion of clergy, where some group of people only have the prerogative of, you know, issuing fatwas or study, you know, Islam is a religion of knowledge, and it encourages knowledge and research. But then until you study, you can't make pronouncements in the Quran, n not even when you even understand the Arabic language. Not even when you understand the Arabic language, not even when you speak Arabic fluently that you turn yourself into a self-imposed mufti. No, you need to study. It's very, very important. You need to study. So those of us who do not understand the Arabic language, but then we can read the Quran, the English Quran, that doesn't mean we can come and say, oh, even the Quran says this or says that or says those. No, 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 no. No. You need to study. Let me give you an example. There is a verse in Surah Al-Baqarah where the Almighty Allah says, "Inna Safa wal Marwa min Allah." Verily, Safa and Marwa are amongst the signs of the Almighty Allah. For man Hajj al or Atamara, anybody who goes for Hajj or Umrah, فَلَا جُنَاهَ عَلَيْهِ أَنْ يَطَوَّفَ بِهِمَا. There is no sin upon him if he is to circumambulate between the two, you know, mountains. Abdullah ibn Zubair ibn al-Awwab. 
this sahabi his father is zubair ibn al-awwam and zubair ibn al-awwam is one of the 10 people that the almighty allah told the prophet to tell them that they will enter jannah before they died they were given that guarantee his son his mother too is asma bint abi bakr his mother is the daughter of Abu, of Abu Bakr Siddiq, the best friend of Prophet Muhammad and his in-law. So look at the kind of home this gentleman is coming from. He said when he was interpreting this verse, he said that there is no, you know, he said that Safa and Marwa in Hajj is not compulsory. And looking at the literal meaning of the verse, that's the meaning. That Safa and Marwa is not compulsory. There is no sin upon you if you do it. So when he was explaining this verse, Aisha radiallahu anha, that madrasa, that school, Aisha herself is a whole university. She told him, mm -mm -mm, Abdullah, Yabna Ukhti, the son of my sister, my nephew. That's not the meaning of the verse. The verse is not implying that Safa and Marwa is not compulsory. You need to understand the reason behind the revelation of the verse before you really, really understand what the verse is driving at. If you don't understand the reason why a verse was revealed or the hadith or the reason why a narration of the hadith came through, you will give a wrong meaning. That is why it's important to study. Reading only the translation of the Quran does not make you an authority. For you to speak that you've read the Quran and the Quran says so, so, and so, and so. No. You make huge mistakes if you're, if you're not careful. So she told him that the reason why the Almighty Allah revealed this verse is that in the Jahiliya period, on the mountain of Safa, there was an idol called Na'ila. On the mountain of Marwa was another, you know, idol called Isaf. So the Kufar in Jahiliya who circumambulate between these two mountains, worshipping these two idols, and then seeking blessings from these two idols. After Islam, when Islam came and the Sahaba had control over Mecca and stuff like that, and those two idols were taken off, when the Sahaba were circumambulating between those two mountains, they felt in their heart as if they were doing something of the Jahiliyyah. As if it was wrong. So the Almighty Allah revealed this verse, keeping them calm and then telling them that, no, keep your calm. Don't worry. When you do circumambulation between these two mountains, there is no sin upon you because there is nothing wrong in doing that. So understanding the reason why the Almighty Allah revealed a verse is a very, very important step in understanding the verse and then implementing it in our lives. So that's why it's important for you to study as a Muslim, especially studying Islam in Arabic. No. No, I'm sure. yeah. So there is this important note on that that you need to understand and read the we read Islam in its Arabic. It's very, very important. So don't rely only on your knowledge of the English, of the Quran, and then say you've seen in the Quran, so, so, and so. You will make a huge mistake. And also don't rely on your Arabic language to try to explain the Quran. Yes, I've seen some of my colleagues, students of knowledge, when they're doing tafsir, they only have the Quran in front of them. No. You need to take notes as we are doing now. You need to have your iPads next to you, you need to do that. You need to take notes, you need to read. Your Arabic language alone is not enough for you to explain the Quran. You need to go back and look at what the classical scholars are saying. Look at Imam Tabari in his tafsir. Take this tafsir, the tafsir of Qurtubi, take the tafsir of uh, Ibn Kathir. Contemporary scholars like tafsir Wahbat al-Zuhayli, tafsir al-Munir, or at tahrir wa tanwir of Ibn Ashur, use those tafasir. Take notes, and then you find out that on one ayah, you can have enough to say, rather than looking at it in your own Arabic and then trying to explain. You might explain a lot of things faultly and wrongly. 
At-Tabari gives you a hadith in explaining the verses, even in explaining a particular word. What does the word mean? He give you hadith that explain the word. Same as Ibn Kathir, he give you a hadith in explaining them. So when you take the classical tafsir, it gives you that understanding of, you know, the classical meanings and then the original meanings of the tafsir. And then when you take contemporary scholars like Wahbat al-Zuhayli and then Ibn Ashur, they contextualize the tafsir for you in our present times. We are only on the definition of the Quran. That's what we are on. And then our time is far spent. My sheikh just, my sheikh and my father, Sheikh Ali just, you know, alerted me. We'll have to, you know, go out, visit one or two people. And I'll have to end here. And that's why we are having our session today earlier because I'm not sure we'll be back in time to for us to have it at the normal time that we have. And uh, we'll pause here. And then this is even half of the definition of the Quran that we've gathered. And with it, we try to go through history and see how best, you know, we can relate to some of these things that we have in the Quran. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. And uh, we have five more minutes to wrap up. If you have any questions, we'll entertain the questions. And if not, we call it a day. Thank you very much, Sister Ru here. The time for our lectures keep changing. Is it possible to let us know? Yes, uh, we'll, we'll do that. We'll do that. We'll find a particular time. The difference in time zones is, is what I'm looking at. But then, uh, if you guys can give us a suggestion as to what particular time is suitable for uh, a lot of you that watch us here, it will be very, very important for us to, to, to find a specific time. Do you guys think that a fast or in Ghana time is okay for you, meaning uh, 4 p.m. Ghana time or 5 p.m. Ghana time? Do you need it right after Asr? or closer to Maghrib, or after Maghrib, or after Taraweeh. These are very, very, you know, flexible times. So we look at them. You can inbox me your suggestions, and then we see what time is best for us. Inshallah, that's why the times keep changing. That's why the time keeps changing. But we would want to see the time where people are more available to, to be able to follow. So please, thank you very, very much for your concern, Sister Rukhia. And may Almighty Allah bless you. My Sheikh Muhammad Sani. May the Almighty Allah so bless you, sweetie Bako, my only sweet, my only one and only sweetie. Thank you very much. Shab Hussein Uthman Traore, may the Almighty Allah bless you. Sayyidah Maryam Saleha, Baban Zonzi. The gentleman that, you know, uh, commented cool Imam, Baban Zonzi, actually his name is Abu Bakr. And uh, he is one of my sheikhs that I learned from, even though I'm his senior when it comes to the Islamic University in Niger. We were in the same room when he came as a fresher. And I was a level 300 student. Very, he has a very bright future, very, very illustrious, very, very humble and obedient. And with Almighty Allah safeguard him and protect him for us. And uh, he normally posts in Arabic on his page, but he understands English, he speaks English too. Okay, thank you very much for being here. Abro of M. Kushtain, my one and only namesake. Thank you very much for passing by. I call him the African mental engineer. He's the engineer of the mind. He speaks to your mind and your soul for you to strive and be a better person. Brahma Hafsa, another wonderful young lady, the daughter of Professor. Usman Bari. If you know Professor Usman Bari, that is his daughter. Wonderful lady. Bob Siddiq is also another wonderful elder brother that we are together. I can't mention everybody's name, but thank you very much. Uh, Mohamed Sani, you asked you ask a question. Uh, what's the question? Can you please repeat it? Can you please repeat it? It might have escaped me. Okay, it was after the live discussion. Okay, that's why it escaped me. So if if there's if you have a question after any of these our live discussions, please send it to my inbox. 
so in my inbox because sometimes the notifications come that someone has commented someone has commented someone has commented and it's very very difficult to be able to sift through the comments to find the questions to be able to answer the questions so if you have questions you can send it to inbox it's very much easier for us to to address them from the inbox but if you send them through the comment section after the live but within the live we can go through and see them but after the live it will be very very difficult for us to go back to look at every you know video that we've done and then try to find out you know the questions in there it's very very difficult so Sheikh Muhammad if you can repeat your question now before we leave we will be able we'll be very very happy in taking them inshallah If you're listening to me, Muhammad Sani, we're waiting for your question so that we wrap up. Robert Mama Sani, we're still waiting for you. It seems my brother is not online for us to take his question, so we'll call it a day, inshallah. And then we'll meet you tomorrow. Uh, we'll try to communicate the time tomorrow through the suggestions that you will make in our inbox concerning the time that you feel is is okay okay thank you very much for your time <clears throat>